Well, good morning, church family. It's uh, good to be with you again uh, today, and and, uh, I'm grateful that you're tuning in and you're utilizing and you're accessing these live streams as we record these each week and as we put this information out and and share the Word of God. We're grateful that you're part of it. Um, This morning, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 21. And we're going to talk about this idea about risking our hearts being broken. So I'll even just ask it as a question. Are you willing to risk your heart being broken? And I'll tell you why in just a second why I'm I'm sharing this. But let let me say this even before I get into uh, some of the things that that I have uh, on my heart to share today. Um, Several weeks ago, before this all started, we were going through a study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And I was right near the end of that study. And in fact, I had just the last section of 1 Thessalonians 5 that I wanted to cover as we wound the series down and finished it up. And I've decided that I'm not going to preach that message. I'm not going to uh, share that sermon until we have the opportunity to meet together face-to-face again. So I'm holding off on that. But what I've been doing over the past few weeks, which I'm sure you've probably noticed if you've been accessing this content, is I've been trying to speak to things that I see happening right now and looking at what God's Word says in regard to maybe even some of the subtleties of what we're experiencing as we all go through this experience together. And so that's what we're doing today as we look at this portion of Scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And even as I ask this question, are you willing to risk your heart being broken? And I'll tell you why I'm phrasing it that way. And I'll, I'll just kind of share a, a brief story that I, of something that I noticed the other day. But the other day, I was scrolling through Facebook, which uh, I I tend to do with regularity anyway, but lately I seem to be doing it a bit more. And I was scrolling through Facebook, and I came across something that was posted by a friend of mine. Uh, This is a friend who has served in ministry for quite a few years. I'm not certain exactly how many years he served in ministry, but he, he, uh, he serves in ministries that are focused on students, particularly. And he shared something on Facebook that knowing this guy, he's a very kind person. Um, He shared something I know with the intention of being helpful, with the intention of being encouraging to other people, but it wasn't received that way by everyone who read it. Now, some people thought it was wonderful, and other people looked at it, and as I was reading through the comments, I saw some of the responses to it, and some of the responses that he received were very, very hurtful. And I thought, why are they attacking him like that? And then I I read through some of the others, and they were very smug. And I thought, stop talking to him that way. I, I, I thought, why would you speak to this guy? This guy's nice to everybody. Why would you talk to him that way? Uh, but it also reminded me as I was looking at this, I thought, all right, you could tell a lot about a person by how they treat someone they disagree with. And so I watched people ripping him apart because they disagreed with something that he posted, which really, and I won't go into the details of it, it was very, like, I don't think most of us would find it all, all that, like, controversial. He was really just trying to post something to be helpful, but... Generally speaking, and, and um, you know, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about this, but generally speaking, it seems like plenty of people are really testy right now. And I can certainly understand why people feel that way. At times, I feel that way. And maybe you're feeling that way, too. You know, I would certainly understand it. But I'm noticing that at present, culturally, people tend to fall into one of several camps. Uh, some people are fearful of contracting a virus. Some people don't feel like it's that much of a threat. Some people want to see commerce and favorite activities resume like normal. Others want to stay in place a little bit longer. And if if I'm honest, I've, I've been real curious to find out where our church family is on some of these issues because we're a diverse group. And so I'm certain that there are are people in, in one of those groups and, and others in some of the other groups. And, and, um, and you could probably, just by virtue of knowing my personality, you could probably guess which one of those groups I probably tend to align a little bit closer to. But here's the thing. I'm bringing that up not so much to highlight our differences. I'm bringing it up before we look at the scripture we're about to look at because I'd like to highlight something else. And what I mean by that is this. For the most part, 
I think that whatever position you hold on some of these relevant topics that everybody's kind of wrestling with right now, my assumption, my guess is that whatever position you've landed on in regard to those things, you've probably landed there because you're trying to practice the thing that you think is the most loving thing to do. You know, we look at these things, we assess the data, and we try and make a decision that we say, all right, the most loving, the most logical thing to do would be this, or would be this. I'm making the assumption that, that that's how we're making these decisions, that we're landing on this because we're trying to figure out what's the most loving, what's the most caring thing we can do. And I think it's probably also a good time to be, for us to be reminded of another universal truth, and that's this. If you love others, so if you're trying to be loving, as you make your decisions that impact your household, your family, our culture, right? You're, you're making your decisions based on what you feel is the most loving thing to do. But if we love others, and if we take the risk to either communicate that love or share that love with them, we also run the risk of having our hearts broken. You can't have your heart broken if you don't actually love people, right? So if you love people, you're running the risk of actually having your heart broken. The very people you may be trying to show love to, the very people that you may be trying to help, the very people you might be trying to advise or assist, whatever, whatever realm you want to point that out in, those very people may in fact break your heart. Now, I want you to think about that, and I want that to stay fresh in our mind today, even as we look at, at 2 Corinthians 12, because I, I, I guess a follow-up question to that that I want to ask is this, do you suppose that Jesus understands that feeling, you know, the feeling of having your heart broken, the feeling of, of your love not being received as the love that you thought you were conveying? Or conveying? Uh, and, and as we follow him, I believe this is an experience that we're going to have to, at least in some respects, get used to. And when you look at the book of 2 Corinthians, and and maybe some of you remember, several years ago, we did a a, a decent study through the book of 2 Corinthians. We actually went through the entire book uh, together. Um, I just want to look at a small portion of uh, chapter 12 today. But in the book of 2 Corinthians, what you see is a very emotional letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Some people think it's the most emotional letter he ever wrote. And he was writing this letter to a church that brought him great joy, but this was also a group of people that had the habit of breaking his heart. So that was the dilemma that he was in in that particular context. They they brought him great joy, but they also broke his heart. And uh, and so we're going to wrestle with that today, what it looks like to show love even when that love isn't received, and we're going to understand hopefully a little bit better about the love that Christ shows to us when you, I mean, Scripture tells us it's possible to grieve the Lord. We can grieve the Lord. And so, you know, as we interact with one another, as we interact with our culture, we make decisions that we think are loving decisions, but at the same time, not everybody receives those decisions that way. And as a result, we run the risk of having our heart broken when we seek to show love that way. So let me have a word of prayer for us, and then we're going to look into this text together, and I'll just go a section at a time as we work our way through it, but let's pray together this morning. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege that it is to be able to look at your word together and think about the things that you communicate to us in it. Lord, right now we're in the midst of just a lot of things that in many respects have us worked up. You know, at times I feel worked up. I feel different than I normally feel, and I'm assuming that, that uh, I'm not the only one that feels that way. And Lord, we know that we're in the midst of a, a testing season, and, and when we're being tested, that tends to, to be when our character shows forth as well. And so we pray that in the midst of this season of testing, that it would become very clear and very obvious that you live within us, that the power of your Holy Spirit would be on display in the fruit that comes out of our lives. So, Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us to have that in mind. We pray that as we look at this portion of Scripture together today, that we would understand more about what it looks like to continue to press on, to serve others, to bless others, to encourage others, even if maybe they don't receive the blessing like we hope that they would, or maybe even if they, they go so far as to break our heart. 
Lord, we know we see an example of this in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, as the Apostle Paul expresses his thoughts. But we pray that we would glean something from this that would be helpful to us in the midst of this particular season. And we commit this time of study in your word to you. And we gra- we're grateful, Lord, for the privilege to be able to spend this time together. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this portion of Scripture together today, one of the first things I want to point out is something that Paul demonstrates when you look at verses 11 through 13, and that's this. People require patience. Let me read these verses for us. This is 2 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 11. It says this. I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. And notice his sarcasm as he says that. Forgive me this wrong. So at the time the apostle Paul wrote these words down, as the the Holy Spirit inspired him to pen these things, What was starting to happen in the city of Corinth, that church had been planted, it was a difficult place to plant a church, but we know, and maybe some of you remember from when we studied this book together a few years ago, one of the issues they were having there were these false teachers had started coming into the church and they were deceiving the people of Corinth. They were kind of setting themselves up as authorities and then deceiving the people of Corinth. What they would do is they would boast in their earthly credentials as they did so and and then, you know, try and gain a following. And, 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 and so you have the Apostle Paul displaying, even in the verses that lead up to the section that we're in right now, he's displaying how foolish that was, and he addresses that here as well. But I try and read his tone when I look at a portion of Scripture like this, and when you look at his tone or try and read into to the tone that he's kind of conveying these things with, he clearly sounded exasperated. He sounded exasperated with the Corinthians as he felt compelled to do this, to illustrate the fact that these false teachers had come and infiltrated them, and they were buying into the silliness. And so he said, all right, I'm willing to look silly in return if that would help you realize that these false teachers have gained a foothold in the church and are actually doing the bidding of Satan and not the bidding of Christ. And so you have these false teachers bragging about themselves. They're puffing themselves up in front of the Corinthians. This becomes a real issue in the city of Corinth at the time. And the truth is, Paul shouldn't have had to do this at all. This wasn't something he should have felt required to do. The believers that were in the Corinthian church, they should have defended him against some of the false accusations that were being aimed at him from some of these false teachers. Um, you know, and, and by the way, these false teachers, what they were doing is they were trying to cut him down and diminish his authority so that they could kind of like supersede that authority and be viewed by the people as an authority higher than the apostle Paul in their lives. And and, and Paul was trying to illustrate how ridiculous that was, particularly when you look at the fact that when Paul, as, as one of the primary leaders in the early church, was going about at the time proclaiming the gospel, going city to city, helping people out, helping people come to know the Lord, preaching a message that many people were very unfamiliar with, one of the ways that the Lord confirmed for other people that Paul was an apostle was through miraculous signs and wonders, and mighty works that could not naturally have been done. The Lord was doing those things through Paul to confirm to people that he was one sent by the Lord, that the message that Paul was conveying was accurate, that this wasn't something that just came off of the the top of Paul's mind or something like that. This was something that was divinely ordained. And so Paul was given the ability at times to do miraculous things, and it demonstrated the fact that the Lord was with him, that the Lord was within him, that the Lord was giving him the power to do what he was doing and to convey the message that he was conveying. And so when I look at a portion of Scripture like this, and you could see, you know, the, the exasperation that Paul is expressing in the midst of this context... I I ask, you know, how do you suppose you might have felt? How do you suppose I might have felt if we were in a spot like Paul was in at this particular point? He had led these people to Christ. He had spent time with them to help train them and develop their faith so that that they would grow in faith in Christ. He was in every way a spiritual father to them. 
And they seem not to be overly bothered by these false teachers that were now cutting him down and leading people astray from the truth of the gospel. I know that if I was in Paul's shoes, that would make me quite sad. That would be very discouraging. I would have felt disappointed. I would have felt discouraged by that kind of experience. But let's be honest about something. And you don't have to be in a teaching role to feel the type of things that Paul was experiencing here. It's not safe to love people. You know, I think right now we're concerned about safety. Well, one of the most unsafe things you can do is love people. It is not safe to love people. And that's okay. It's okay that it's not safe. If you're going to work with people, if you're going to seek to make an investment in the life of somebody else, it's going to require you to be patient with them. Leaders forget this sometimes. Pastors forget this sometimes. Parents forget this sometimes. But people require patience. Whomever you're working with, whomever you're trying to serve, they will require patience. So you have to kind of prepare yourself for that. Um, Many of you know I have a household full of teenagers. And one of my favorite things to do at home is to remind them uh, or tell them of stories from my teenage years, because I think I was an interesting teenager. Uh, I, I don't know that I necessarily fit a super obvious mold. You know, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't know. In my mind, I think I was kind of a, a, a unique person in some respects. But I was very opinionated. Now, that is not uncommon, okay? Uh, but I was a very opinionated teenager, I was, and I was not very fearful of making those opinions known. And uh, back then, I had my life and my future all planned out. And I will say, a lot of those things came to pass, but some of them didn't. But I had it all planned out, and I would tell whoever was willing to listen what my plans were and what my thoughts were. And I emphatically told my family that under no circumstances was I going to college. It wasn't happening, and they wanted to know why. And my big reason was, I think it's a total waste of money. Total waste of money. I'm not going to college. I think it's a total waste of money. I'm not doing it. And I insisted on it. And through my sophomore year of high school, through my junior year of high school, even for most of my senior year of high school, I wasn't planning to go to college. It was not on my radar, not interested, thought it was a total waste of money. And I remember uh, several of my family members, my father and my uncles uh, in particular, would tell me, you might change your mind on that. And as we got close to the end of my senior year, and I started to realize you know, I really do need to start making some decisions about what my life is going to look like uh, past this this particular season, I actually decided to go to college. And um, decades later, so it was about 20 years after that fact, when I was actually, not only had I gone to college, but I had had gotten several degrees and was teaching in a college. I was having a discussion with my uncle, and uh, he was asking me how the courses I was teaching at the college were going, and I, I told him, and of course, he brought up the fact, with, you know, with a smirk on his face, he said to me, remember when you said you were never even going to college? <laughs> remember when you said that wasn't going to happen because to you it was a total waste of money and you weren't going and, and you had your mind made up and you insisted on it? And he loved bringing that up to me. He absolutely loved it. I think it was my, my, favorite, my uncle's favorite conversation that he ever had with me to be able to bring that up and point that out to me. And again, not only my uncle, but my father, who is watching the live stream right now, so hello, Dad. Um, My father, my uncles, they all like to remind me that I was one of those teenagers that took a degree of extra patience to put up with. I took extra patience to put up with. But truthfully, when you look at what this Scripture demonstrates, and when you look at the totality of what Scripture teaches, we're all needed, we, we, or excuse me, we all need to be shown patience. And there's no greater example of the gift of patience being shown to us than what we see our Lord showing to us. And in fact, in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, Scripture tells us this, "...the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Isn't that a beautiful portion of Scripture? It reminds us that the Lord is being patient with us. 
He's being patient with humanity. He's being patient with us as individuals because he wants us to reach the spot of repentance. And he knows how we work. He made us. He designed us. He knows that at times it takes time for us to get to that point. Sometimes it takes falling on our face a few times. Sometimes it takes life experiences. Sometimes it takes a season of growing in wisdom. But the Lord shows us patience. He's, he's abundantly patient with us, amazingly patient with us. And he invites us as people who are the recipients of the patience that he shows us to be patient with one another. You know, again, I, I'll scroll through Facebook again throughout the course of this coming week. I imagine that feed would look drastically different if we were all displaying just the utmost patience with one another. People require patience. Christ demonstrated that. The Apostle Paul was certainly learning that and demonstrating that as he worked with the people of Corinth. And probably your patience and my patience might be tested right now, but just the same, people require patience. Something else that Paul brings up in 2 Corinthians 12 that I, I love thinking about, and that's this, true love costs you something. Think about this for just a second. True love costs you something. Let me read what he says, starting with verse 14. He says, here for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit? Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go, to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not, did we not take the same steps? It's fascinating as Paul kind of outlines how he was interacting with the church at Corinth. Um, a while ago, some friends of mine who also have four children, they asked me if they could compare water bills. And I said, yeah, you know, we could compare water bills. And they, they were, their water bill one particular month they felt was abnormally high. And they said, can we compare our water bills? What's your water bill look like? And so I showed them my water bill, and, you know, we have the same amount of people in our household as they have in theirs, and theirs was abnormally high, and this is what we discovered as I showed them my water bill. My water bill was $30 higher than theirs was. So that got me thinking, like, wait, what's going on? Their abnormally high water bill, mine's $30 higher than their water bill, and we all have the same amount of people living in our houses. I don't know what was going on there, but have you ever come across some of the studies that reveal how much it will cost to raise children from birth to adulthood. I came across a study some time ago. It was put out actually by the Department of Agriculture. And they, in the study, it's only a few years old, but in the study they said a middle-income married couple with two children. So think about this. I know some of you uh, have two children, right? So a middle-income married couple with two children is estimated to spend $233,610 to raise a child born in 2015. So some of you have children that were born in 2015. This is their estimate of what it's going to cost you to raise that child to adulthood. And by the way, they said that number only covers up until age 17, and it doesn't include college. So what do you think about that number? Is that realistic? Our family shops at Aldi, so you know I think our number is a little bit lower than that. But the point is, when you look at that study, and when you look at just the reality of day-to-day -day life, loving a child and providing care for a child is going to cost you something. And likewise, showing love in an active and in a genuine way toward anyone is going to cost you something. Look at some of the costs that the Apostle Paul paid in order to show love and to minister to the Corinthians. Multiple times, he says here, he traveled to them. And he bore the cost of that travel, and he experienced the danger that came with that travel. And when he was with them, he also says that he did not burden them financially. But he worked at a trade in order to be able to minister to them for free. We know that he made tents, and he worked at that trade so that he could minister in Corinth for free. And when he sent others, men like Titus, when he sent Titus to them, 
He urged them to treat the Corinthians the same exact way he had. So these are people serving the Corinthians, but not expecting anything from them. They're not trying to get something from them. They're just trying to serve. They're just trying to show genuine love. They came to share the sacrificial love of Christ with this group of people. And the mindset that Paul was displaying to this church was that of a loving father to his children. So even though the the Corinthians weren't Paul's biological children, they were certainly his spiritual children because he shared the message of the gospel with them. And he says elsewhere in Scripture that when he did so, he was terrified. He did so with great fear. But he shared the message of the gospel with them. They came to know Christ. He invested himself in their growth. They were very much his spiritual children. So his goal was to give to them, not take from them. And by the way, have you ever had the privilege of sharing the gospel with someone and, and then praying with them that they, would, that they would have the opportunity to trust in Christ and then watching them go from, from unbelief to belief? Have you ever had that experience where you've actually had the privilege to walk with someone as they, they've come to faith in Jesus Christ? When the Lord blesses you with that experience, it's one of my favorite experiences when the Lord allows me to have it. But when the Lord blesses you with that experience, it's only right to be concerned with the spiritual well-being of the person that you just had the privilege to lead into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I just had a very interesting experience. It just happened the other day. I got an email from a woman in Scotland who said, I've been, and I'll paraphrase her email, but she said, I just wanted to send you a quick message and let you know that I've been reading your books And as a result, I've come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I've come to know Him through the things that you've been writing down and sharing. So thank you for making these things available. Please keep doing it. So I responded to her message because at that point I felt like, all right, if this woman has come to faith in Jesus Christ, even though she lives quite distant from where I live, she's come to know Christ through something that the Lord enabled me to write. I all of a sudden felt like I have a responsibility to continue making investments there. And so I reached out to her and basically said, like, what do you, what do you need to continue to grow? What can I offer you that will help you in this process? And I found a way that I could digitally deliver a whole bunch of other content to her that will help her grow in her walk with Christ because I felt a burden now. I think the same way that the Apostle Paul felt a burden for the church at Corinth. You think, all right, you have the privilege to lead someone into a relationship with Christ. All of a sudden, they're on your radar as someone that you have a spiritual responsibility for. And so that's how Paul felt toward the people of Corinth. He felt like he had a spiritual responsibility for them. And so he was helping them. He was trying to guide them. Uh, in a very real sense, he had a parenting role in their life. And if you're investing in someone's ongoing growth, no matter what realm you're trying to do this in, whether it be in their spiritual growth or their physical growth or in the growth of their health or whatever it may be, if you're trying to invest in someone else's growth, understand this, it will cost you something. So be prepared for that price. It's going to cost you something. I love what Paul says in verse 15. We just read it, but I'll reread it for us. He says, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? So what's he telling us? Well, he's telling us if you're trying to make investments in the lives of other people, you will spend and be spent for the souls of those you truly love. Now, I'll say this. I've always been amazed at what parenting has taught me about the love of God, because when I look at my life, the majority of my money, the majority of the miles on my car, the majority of my hours of the week outside of work, it's spent on my kids and with my kids. And I'm okay with that expense because I love them. And I still remember the emotions that I felt when I first saw them. And it's amazing to think when you first look at a child and you think, okay, I've only seen you now for mere moments, but already the impulse within me is that I would give my life for your life. And you you find yourself amazed at the depth of the love that you have for them. But again, true love costs you something. And when you feel that emotion for someone else, understand that that's an impulse, that's an emotion that the Lord gives to us as a gift, because it helps us understand His heart toward us. He understands that true love costs something. 
Look at the price he paid for your freedom and for my freedom. Look at the price he paid to rescue and redeem us from the shackles of sin. True love costs you something. Scripture shows us multiple examples of the love of Christ. I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 tells us. There it says this, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So again, earlier in his first letter to the Corinthians, you have the Apostle Paul saying, You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Well, what was the price that was paid? The price that was paid to purchase you and purchase me, to purchase our freedom, to make us part of the family of God? The price that was paid was the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and it was shed for you and for me. True love cost him something. I love what we're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. There it says this, of Christ, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed." Again, we see another perfect example of this. True love costs you something. Christ demonstrated it to us, but he's also preparing us to have the same exact mindset that he has. One other thing that Paul brings up in 2 Corinthians 12 that I want to highlight for us this morning is this. When you look at verses 19 down to verse 21, uh, Paul shows us that genuinely caring for others can be risky. It can be a risky thing to do, but look at what it says here. In verse 19, it says, Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ, and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling and jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. So again, just as true love can cost you something, Investing yourself emotionally in the well-being of others can be risky because you can't control what they do. And since you can't control what they do, you you recognize that they may indeed break your heart. And that's what Paul was saying here. Am I going to come to you and have my heart broken? Am I going to be utterly humiliated by what I find when I come? That's something Paul was genuinely wrestling with here. He was going to be visiting them again in the future, he says. And he doesn't know exactly when that date is going to be. And he he says, you know, his plan is that he was going to have others with him as he did this, believers from Macedonia who would be coming with him, and they'd be meeting the Corinthians for the very first time. It's kind of like, you know, when you you first uh, introduce someone you're dating to your family. It's like, here's my family. And you wonder in the back of your head, I wonder what they're going to think of my family and me when they actually meet these people. And so Paul is saying, you know, I'm going to be coming. I'm going to be bringing others from Macedonia with me. I'm going to introduce them to you. What are we going to find? Is this going to be utterly humiliating when I bring them to you and introduce them to you, and then we discover that there's all sorts of issues taking place that are unresolved and unrepented of? What state are you going to be in when we come? Are you going to be living a devoted life for Christ, or are you going to be immersing yourself in the things of the world all over again? Paul was genuinely concerned. You could see that in the way he phrases these things here. But his aim all along had been to build them up in their walk with Christ. But again, working against this were others who were actively tearing them down. There were these false apostles who were fostering an attitude of greed and an attitude of self-righteousness among them. And within the church, there had been problems, he says here, with quarreling and with jealousy and with anger and hostility and slander and gossip and conceit and disorder. These were issues that were taking place in the church at the time. And Paul was also concerned that, that some had actually maybe not repented yet of their sin of sexual immorality. So he wondered, you know, what, what am I going to find when I come and visit? What am I going to find when I come and see you? And this question was weighing on his mind. It was weighing on his heart. But he wasn't willing to stop caring for them, even though this concern was causing his heart to grieve. Now, you've probably been hurt by people over the course of your life. I've certainly been hurt by people over the course of my life. And when people hurt us, 
One of the easiest things we can find ourselves doing is becoming very, very defensive. We build up walls in order to protect our hearts so that we don't have to experience any more pain. And some people pretty much just choose to spend their life living in isolation over time just to avoid that pain. And others become adept at lashing out. And some of us stop taking risks because we don't want to be hurt anymore. And I know plenty of people who used to joyfully serve others that over time they experienced so much pain that they just decided it's not worth it. I need to stop. I can't take any more pain. I know former church leaders who actually find it rather difficult to even attend churches now because of the arrows that were aimed at them when they took the risk to genuinely care for others in the past. This is a very difficult thing to wrestle with. And there's certainly nothing wrong with resting up and healing after going through a risky season that bruised you up a bit. I totally understand that, and I totally identify with that. But in the end, keep in mind, showing love for others and showing genuine care for others is a risky thing to do because you have no idea how the people that you're trying to help are going to treat your heart in response. You have no idea how they're going to respond to your care or to your concern. They may nurture you and care for you in return, or they may rip your heart out. You don't know which one they're going to do, and so it's a risk because you don't know how they're going to respond, and you're opening yourself up to that risk. But thankfully, our Lord is here to pick up the pieces. If you're one of those people that takes those risks, I want to applaud you because I think that's important for us to do as believers in Christ. We want to take the risk to serve others. We want to take the risk to love others. We want to take the risk to to invest in others, even if they don't like the kind of investment we're trying to make. We still want to take that risk. And... um, And our Lord, thankfully, is there to pick up the pieces if the way people respond to that isn't quite favorable. I love what Scripture tells us in Psalm 34, verses 18 and 19. I want to read it for us. In those two verses, it says this, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Isn't that wonderful? That the, Lord, that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, that the Lord saves those who are crushed in spirit, that if you're righteous, yeah, you might have many difficulties in this world, but the Lord will deliver you from them all, from every single one of them. The Lord will deliver you from them all. So let me say this as we finish up this morning. The Lord's sympathetic with our struggles. The Lord provides His strength whenever we take the risk to love others and serve them in His name. But understand this, people require patience. This scripture demonstrates it. True love is going to cost you something. Genuinely caring for others is going to be a risky thing to do. But if God's people won't take that risk, who will? If we're not going to take that risk, who's going to do it in our place? This is the calling of God on our life. It's not safe to love people, but it's good. And Christ hasn't called me to live a life where I'm trying to be overly safe. He hasn't called you to to live a life where you're just trying to guard every last thing. Take the risk to love people as the Lord impresses upon your heart to do so. Even if you take arrows like my friend did the other day, even if you take arrows from your children or from those that you love or or, or from your siblings or from from, uh, your coworkers or whomever it may be, take the risk to love people, because Christ's calling on our lives is to love others with the kind of sacrificial love that He has always been willing to show to us. Let's pray. Lord, thank You so much for the reminders that You give to us from Your Word. Lord, we're grateful for the privilege that it is to be able to read it together today, to be able to think about these things today to be able to see what it was like for those who came before us. Lord, we know that when you walked on this earth and you did all the things that you did during the course of your earthly ministry, we know some people received that well and some people just continually attacked you. And your servants have experienced that ever since. Paul certainly experienced that as he was trying to minister to the people of Corinth. Uh, My friend experienced that the other day. Every single one of us, if we're trying to live out our faith in you and we take the risk to make that faith known and we we live out that, that faith by serving other people, Lord, we recognize that we're taking a risk to do so. It's risky to show love. It's not safe 
to love people. We might have our heart broken, but it's still worth doing because that's exactly what you did for us. So Lord, we're grateful for all that you've endured on, on our behalf. We're grateful for your blood that was shed for us. We're grateful for the price you were willing to pay so that we could be rescued, so that we could be redeemed. And we're grateful that we have the privilege to walk with you right now. Thank you as well for the promise you've given to us in your word that you rescue us from distress. You rescue us from difficulty and, and uh, any kind of calamity that may come our way. Lord, we seek your intervention for us right now, for us as individuals, for us as a church, for us as a world. We just ask for your intervention and that ultimately your name would be glorified and that we would come out on the other side of our trials giving you praise for how wonderful you are and for how you orchestrate things so perfectly and so ideally in your perfect time. So Lord, we thank you for these things and we thank you for this reminder from your word today. Help us to live it out, particularly right now when maybe we feel like it could be a little bit extra difficult to do so. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us this morning. I'm really grateful that you carve out time to be with us as we, as we uh, join together in this unique form of, of uh, online fellowship, online community, online worship. And, um, and we're just grateful for each of you. Uh, please know that during the course of the week, we're praying for you. If there's something that you'd like uh, prayed for during the course of this week, never hesitate to reach out. We have a prayer team just ready to pray for whatever needs may come up. But I hope that the Lord is uh, just making himself known to you in so many new ways right now and that you can sense his strength upholding you in the midst of all that you're dealing with. So again, thank you for being with us today. And we're looking forward to com- uh, I'm looking forward to being able to see you face to face, hopefully soon. But in the meantime, thanks for holding in there. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks. Thanks.